Here we have our memory verse. Okay, ready? Let nothing be done. Is it on? Hello? Okay, here we go. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Here we go again. Ready? Here we go. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. There you go. But then we have to do this one, right? God is here. God is real. God is God. And I am not, am not God's will. God's way. God's time. God is here. God is real. God is God. And I am not, am not God's will, God's way, God's time. That's right. <laughs> Let's just start out with the cough and get that over with. So, um, yeah, so um, I have asked Bethany to uh, come up, and I just needed to share a little story with you all that has to do with Chapter 2, and um, uh, it is available on YouTube, so I'll let you know where to get it, but I'm asking Bethany if she would just play a little music behind, because when it's read, it's uh, online, it's read with an English accent and music behind it and all that. I will not do the English accent, although you will listen carefully. So um, she's just going to play some music for us, so the power of love is greater than the love of power. William Gladstone worked for equal opportunity for people, including self-rule in Ireland. He strove toward those goals for the four terms he was in England's, he was England's prime minister, and he kept fighting for the causes he believed in, even when he wasn't in office. Gladstone's belief in God colored all his choices, and he continued to grow and to learn, and found it was very important for a deep study of God's word. The general population fondly called him the People's William or Grand Old Man. On this day in history, August 15, 1892, Gladstone was elected prime minister for the fourth, for, <laughs> for the fourth time. The power of love is greater than the love of power. By day, Gladstone had a busy, important job, but in his later years, many nights, he walked the streets of London looking for women to rescue. The icy London wind cut through his overcoat, and the rhythmic clacking of his heels echoed off the cobblestone walk. In the dark, he heard the sound of a woman sobbing. 
Madam, you do seem quite distressed, he said. Is there anything at all that I can do to help? Gladstone's breath ascended like smoke rings in the frigid air. Sir, you're most kind to inquire. However, I fear that my life at the moment requires more than I would want to burden a stranger with, she sniffled and forced a smile. I see, Gladstone said. Well, I am, in fact, no stranger to the people of England, and I don't believe that there is any urgency you may be facing with which I cannot assist. The two stood in silence. Slowly, her lip began to quiver as she fought back the tears suddenly welling up in her weary eyes. Perhaps, but her voice broke and she started to weep. Gladstone reached into the inside pocket of his overcoat and offered his silk handkerchief. There's a much better way of life than this for a young woman like you. It's late tonight, bitterly cold out, and anyone could conclude from your attire the profession that you are in. Is this the life that you've chosen, or did this life somehow choose you, asked Gladstone. Kind sir, I ran away from home as a very young girl to escape my father's violence. One horrible decision led to another, and now I find myself at the mercy of violent men every day, she said. I have nowhere to turn for help, nowhere to sleep tonight unless I turn the trick. Filled with compassion, Gladstone looked at her and said, tonight there's a bed waiting for you without any strings attached. He said, my wife will gladly look after you at our home this evening. And in the morning, we will secure for you more permanent lodging at the hostel, which we maintain for women similarly, similarly situated. Our people will be pleased to help you begin at once exploring a new dignified course for your life. The choice in all of this is, of course, yours. Her eyes grew wide with both hands, the disheveled young woman wiped the dark lines of tears and mascara from her cold red cheeks. Sir, she said in disbelief, I am indeed speechless of your offer. Who are you, if I may ask, and why is it that you would want to help someone like me? Every man of power that I've ever encountered has wanted to use that power to his advantage, certainly not to mine. Perhaps in this dim light you'll not recognize me, but please forgive me for not already offering a proper introduction, he said. My name is William E. Gladstone, and I am the Prime Minister of England. And as such, you will find that I am happily at your service and at the service of all those who call our beautiful country their home. Philippians 2.4 says, do not merely look out for the, your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. What a story that is. Now, if you would like to, uh, and we're just going to, Lord Jesus, I just thank you, Father. I thank you that you have shown us what one person can do. It was one person that he talked to, one person that went to one person. And he could have looked at the whole situation and said, there's nothing I can do. There's, it's too hard. It's too much. And yet, one on one. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this study that you've put together today. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us an opportunity, Lord, to look into what you want us to be like. Father, that you have given us an example to live by, that you have shown us how to live a humble life and not be proud, not be all these things that are in our chapter this week. Father, we give this time to you and we bring you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bethany. I love the music in the background. That was so great. This is on, right? Yeah. Okay. That, that's good to know <laughs> since everything's over. Um, so if you want to watch this, go to 365 
ChristianMen.com. 365 ChristianMen.com. And uh, you can do a slash William Gladstone if you want to read um, on that, um, on William Gladstone. They have a whole bunch of different ones. So all of the different Christian men and what they did. So 365ChristianMen.com. So you can go to that. And so um, I just want to read to you Cheryl, Cheryl Matsunagu as you know, has been part of our, our fellowship for some time. And this is the letter that we just received, September 24th. We hope all is well with each of you. And this is actually goes with our study. I have returned to civilian life after 30 days at UCI Hospital and Rehab. I am still without a knee, my knee replacement having been removed because of infection. They are saying it is a long process trying to kill the infection, so probably into 2022. Though there have been many blessings along the way, including prayers for, uh, for and with many staff members, the road has been very painful, like this morning. I couldn't move my back or left leg. Prayer and Oxycontin helps. Brad has to lift me up, her husband Brad, each time to get into the wheelchair. I am le learning to maneuver on rug, which is hard to do, and go to the restroom with one leg elevated. Brad has been a wonderful example of a Christian husband, and I am very blessed with the meal prep, vacuuming, yard work, and just lots of care. Thank you for your prayers and love through my Heart to Heart group. Several refuge members have surprised us with yummy food and again, those prayers through prayer warriors, Kathy Craig, Friday night, a Friday group, and various refuge family. Though I haven't been able to travel, the Lord brought the world to me. I met Afghans, Afghanis, Tunisians, Somalians, Armenians, Persians, Indians, Filipinos, Vietnamese, Polish, Mexican, and others. It was really exciting to be able to pray for these care workers, and they were appreciative to receive prayer. Two nurses even asked if they could pray for me, so that was wonderful. May not be able to join you for uh, a while longer, but pray for refuge staff, church, and family. God bless each one of you. And then she said, I am on 10 meds, plus must give myself a shot to the stomach while Brad does a liquid infusion. I have the leg elevated and a drain vacuum attached to the knee, drawing away any liquid staff from the wound. Nurses, therapists visit daily. So, um, wow. Wow. What is wow is, number one, we're going to pray for, continue to pray for her. But the wow is, here she is in this situation, and she's touching other lives. So, wonderful, wonderful woman to share with. And so, Lord, we do lift up Cheryl right now, Father, and we see you placing your hand on that knee. Lord, uh, we pray, Father, that that infection in the name of Jesus would be dissipated, that it would be completely drawn out, that there would be not even the slightest notice of it. Lord Jesus, I pray for Cheryl as she walks through this time. What a warrior she is for your kingdom, Lord. What a prayer warrior she is. What a lover of you she is. Lord, she and Brad constantly reaching out to people no matter what their situation. Father, I pray that you would reward her with good health. Lord, and that you would do the healing that's necessary. There is nothing too hard for you. We believe that you are doing it right now. We believe that you are doing it, Lord, and we are anxious to see how you're going to do it. And Father, we, we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I, I don't know if you have read some of the things that are going on. We do want to be praying for our uh, missionaries. 
uh, particularly for the Russells who are in Melbourne, Australia. The things that are going on in Australia right now with people being arrested for going out, they have been in lockdown for 568 days, something like that. And they can only go a certain distance from their house. Um, they, uh, uh, yeah, and it is uh, unbelievable the things that are going on. Um, the Russells have a church there in Melbourne, the church that Bill and I started in Melbourne, and um, they are not allowed to have church. They're not allowed to meet other people. They're not allowed to gather together. You can go to the grocery store during these hours, and you must have something with you that says who you are and what you're doing and where you live so that the, the grocery store is not further away from your house than, than you're allowed to travel. They are arresting people. Um, in, uh, in Canada, they are arresting pastors who kept their churches open, and they are, have been sentenced to six years in prison for having their church open during the time that the government said it needed to be closed. So we need to be praying, not just for the Christians, but for the opportunity to share Christ wherever we're at. That's what Cheryl is doing. Wherever she's at, she's sharing Christ. Whatever our situation, we share Christ. So why do we put scriptures on Instagram? Why do we put scriptures on Facebook? Why do we put scriptures at every opportunity that we can? Why do we share Christ at every opportunity? Because the day is short. The day is short, and Jesus Christ is coming back for his beloved, for those who love his appearing. And so... None of that can be done without humility on our part. And humility is the key to our scripture today, to um, Ephesians chapter 2. <laughs> Philippians, did I, what did I say? Yep, because I was looking at the other page. <clears throat> I'll give you a moment to turn to the right book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Humility is the theme of second, uh, the second chapter of Philippians. Here, I, I just want to warn you, I did not sleep last night. I just didn't sleep last night. So if I, I'm not on drugs, I just want you to know that. Um, if I sound really weird, it's that. So anyway... <clears throat> It's humility. Here in the chapter throughout the entire book, we are being taught how to pattern our lives. How do we pattern our lives? Have you ever said, I want to be like so-and-so when I grow up? I want to be like that person. Even as you've been an adult, have you ever said, I want to be like somebody else? Who do you want to be like? In chapter two, we have a vision or we have an explanation of who we are to fashion our lives after, who we're to pattern our lives after. In our text, we find that that person to pattern our, pattern our life after is not Paul. It's not the church of Philippi. It's not, the, uh, it's not Lydia. It is not uh, Epaphroditus. It's not the jailer in Philippi. It is our, our uh, yeah, in Philippi. <laughs> We are to pattern our lives after Jesus. We are to pattern our lives after Jesus, and that's what this chapter covers. And so we look at our, our text as we get into our text. We, our text starts with therefore. And so when you start with therefore, what, what is the phrase? What is it therefore? What, what is it attached to? In chapter 1, verse 29, it says, for you to it has been for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him but what also to suffer wait wait i didn't sign up for that mm -mm, nope 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 not not doing it not doing it okay so paul tells us in this letter he tells us this is going to happen Suffering happens to everybody. It's going to happen to us as believers in a different way than it happens to other people. 
because it will come against our relationship with Jesus Christ. The most important thing that is going on in our life today is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so having said that, he says, therefore, because I've told you you're going to go through suffering, he says, and if you will look at, if you will read verse 1 and 2, uh, uh, verse 1, you, in, instead of if, it can also, also be translated since. So since there is any consolation in Christ, since there is comfort and love, since there is fellowship of the Spirit, since there is affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We are to be like-minded, it says. All of these things have been provided for us. We have consolation, the consolation in Christ. We have comfort and love. We have fellowship of the Spirit. We have affection and mercy. Those things fulfill my joy by being like-minded. We have those things available to us, and Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Everything in most of us, I would say that the, most of us have a number of things we disagree on. Yeah? Yeah. But we cannot disagree on the essentials. We can fight, oh, we cannot, we cannot divide over masks, we cannot divide over vaccine, we cannot divide over all of these things that are coming up. I, we divide over the person that we listen to. I'm not going to listen to that person. Uh, well, I really like that person. Okay, so I'm, I'm against you now because you like that person, I don't like that person, and we have that division happening. But can we agree? Can we agree on the essentials? That's what Paul's talking about. You must agree on the essentials. What are the essentials? Who is Jesus? That is an essential to have like-mindedness. Who is Jesus? And he is the Son of God. He's God the Son. What is salvation? What are we being saved from? We are being saved, for, we are being saved that we might experience eternal life. Jesus Christ came. He lived. He died. He died, he rose again, that we might have eternal life. And we, uh, we have to agree on what is sin. Yes, I said the word. There is sin in the world. And sometimes there is sin in the camp. And we need to deal with it. We need to be like-minded on it. It is sin when the Bible says that it's sin. It's not sin when it's just my opinion about it. When the Bible says that it is sin, we had better agree on what the Bible says as sin because this is the word of God. This is the very word of God. Everything else is secondary, and we need to be of one mind on essentials. Humility shows in our attitude. Humility shows in our attitude. The humble love and serve others. And we see that in our text here. He can be happy, Paul can be happy over the fact that you are just simply like-minded to be servants of one another. And I think, I can't help but mention Rusty, whose memorial service we went to on Saturday. Rusty, I learned so many things about this man who lived for other people. Once he came to Christ, he was, he was unstoppable. He found ways to minister to other people that uh, some people didn't even know that he was doing. I didn't know he packed lunches and took them over to the library just so that he could talk to the people who don't have a place to stay. Just to find out, how you doing? Is there some way I can help you out? Is there something I can do for you? There was not a lot of fanfare in what Rusty did because they, he was a servant. 
He was a servant of the Most High. He was a humble man with a bright, bright vision of we can do this. I love that uh, his sister uh, shared. He, Rusty is the sister of Sharon Johnson, who is uh, uh, Karen, Karen Don Johnson. I'm sorry. Rusty is the sister, brother. <laughs> These two are related, and uh, they are related with the, with, with the woman at Downey. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, and she shared a story with us when she, uh, I guess their, their mom was pretty interesting. So, um, they, her brother and her were outside. They were in a mud puddle. They were literally in a mud puddle. And he convinced his sister that you are in the Mississippi River. <laughs> this is the Mississippi River. Mom yells out and said, get out of that mud puddle. And he said, don't you listen to her. This is the Mississippi River. <laughs> this is the, and convinced her, this is the, Miss it sounds like your brother. Um, <laughs> This is the Mississippi River. And you know what? He cared for her. He cared for her. He was protecting her. And he cared for her. We have models right here in this group. And if I start naming off names, I'll, I'll miss somebody and hurt somebody's feelings. But, you know, one person, I will mention one person who really stands out to me um, is, is Irene. Irene, how the way that she ministers to people, the way that she is filled with that joy unspeakable and full of glory, the way that she just goes about serving without any fanfare, without anything. That's what we're talking, make my heart glad by serving that way. And so let this mind be in you, which was, um, which was also in Christ Jesus verse 5, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of, man, of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus did not grab for the power. Jesus became a man. He, Jesus was God he is God. He will always be God. He is God the Son. He is a person who was meek, who had that strength under control. Jesus was always God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word? Jesus is the Word. And he, uh, he came and he dwelt among us in Jesus. He was always God, will always be God, but he set aside his heavenly power, so to speak, that he might experience everything that we experience and without sin. That he had a purpose in his life and that purpose, you know, you can say that, oh, well, he had extra strength to get through without sinning. He said he became, he was all man. He was all man. Does he have a glorified body in heaven? I believe so. In the same way that we will have that glorified body. He humbled himself to go to the cross, obedient unto death. Obedient unto death. And I have to ask myself, will I die to my own self-interest daily for the sake of someone else? Will I die to my own self-interest daily for the sake of others? I need to ask myself that question. Verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue, every tongue will confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. There will come a day when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It does not say that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Savior. 
but even those who didn't believe, even those who won't believe, even those who will not accept the truth, will, on their knee, they will bow and they will confess that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the word of God. That is what will happen. And James 4.10, uh, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves so that you can stand before him. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not, as, not, all, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Has there been anybody that you looked at that and you thought, I don't get this. Does anybody feel that way? Have you felt that way? No? I was it. I was it when I was a new Christian, you know? Work out your own salvation. When you go to the gym, it, it, well, okay, so it doesn't say that you work for your salvation. You are not working for your salvation. Salvation is a free gift. But when you go to the gym, what do you do? You do a workout. You are working out the things that you already have. And you are looking different because you're working through them. You're working them out. You will look different. You will talk different. You will feel different. All of those things, your body, I'm, I'm told, will look different <laughs> if you go to the gym. I heard something about that at one time. And then he goes, salvation changes us. It changes our lives. We become new creations, new creatures in Christ. We should look and live differently after we've given our heart to the Lord. When I gave my heart to the Lord, and it wasn't a big, you know, la -la -la, you know, it wasn't a big, I want to say not a big deal, but it was a huge deal. But it wasn't, a, you know, firecrackers going off. Yeah, there, there, were, there were no songs singing. In there. But immediately... I changed my manner of dress. Immediately, I changed the things that I said, my language. Immediately, I changed what I did with my free time. It just happened because I was working out my own salvation. I was working that out and becoming that new person. So those things were set aside. It's not the works of salvation, but it is the fruits of salvation. Not the works of salvation, but the fruits of salvation. And ver verse 13 shows us who the coach is. It is God who works in us both to will, to want to, and to do, take action on what he tells us to do. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So I want to please God. I want to please God. So what am I going to say? Lord, tell me what to do, and then I'm going to do it. How do I please God? Listen to the Lord and walk in obedience. Easy thing. Pray and listen. Okay, so verse 14. Do all things. Oh, really? Are we there already? <laughs> do all things without complaining and disputing. Do all things without complaining or disputing. Okay, can we move on from there? Let's, uh, you know, what comes to my mind when I think about this, because sometimes, you know, I say this in defense, because sometimes you'll look at something and you go, you know what, that should really change, it should be different this way. That's not complaining, that's instruction. But when we are constantly at the same thing over and over again, that's complaining. Have you ever found yourself in a car with someone, or but certainly you would not be this person. Um, you're in a car and the person is saying all kinds of things about the person that's not getting across the street fast enough. 
or there, you, you say things that you would never say to a person, but you think you're confined in the car and nobody knows. But you know what? Jesus knows. And when, when those kinds of things happen, it reveals something in my heart. When I can look at another person and think that I am hidden in what I'm saying and say those things, maybe even out loud. I don't do this, by the way. I just thought I'd tell you I don't do this. <laughs> but I have at times gone... Can, you know, the steering wheel. You know, it, I'd like to go sometime if you'd like to go. Everything in me is doing this, you know. I'm complaining in my heart. I'm complaining in my heart. God knows the thoughts and the intents of my heart. And so, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, wouldn't be now, hmm. among whom you shine as lights in the world. Ladies, we shine as lights in the world. You are the light of the world. That's what scripture says. You are the light of the world. How will they see if we don't shine? How will the world see if we don't shine? In this perverse, uh, gen crooked and perverse generation, verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. That we have not hold firmly to the word of, of life. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. And Paul says... I need to know that you are holding fast to this word of life. I need to know that you're holding fast to Christ because I want to know that I have not run in vain. I have not labored in vain, but you are moving on with the things that I've already taught you. Yes, and, I, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, if I'm being poured out on the sacrifice as the sacrifice as a drink offering of the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. I want you to make it, is what Paul is saying. I want you to make it. He was living for others. He was living a humble life. He was living for others. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Don't be sad that I'm in this situation. Pray for me. Yes, I'd like to be out of this situation, but I don't want you to be worried about me here. But here we go. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you. You know, I, I do want to say that Paul is saying, even if I die, I want you to know how much joy it brings me to know that you are walking with God. I think it's in 1 John that it says, I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking with the Lord. Paul had no greater joy than to know that those who he had shared with were walking with the Lord. Adversity advances the gospel. Adversity advances the gospel. Verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. I have no one else who's like-minded who will sincerely care for you. What does it say? For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. Not everybody is humble. Not everybody who has accepted Christ is walking in a way to serve others. Not all of us are servants. Not all of us. We are all. All of us in here are. Yes, we all are servants. Yes, yes, you are. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. I remember back in the day, back in the Jesus movement, and I, you know what? I lived through those times. These are the things I have to share. It hasn't happened since, so I'll take it from there. Um, Church on the way. It was the place to be. 
Costa Mesa was the place to be, Church on the Way was the place to be in the other area. And it seemed that some of the elders, the people who had been appointed elders, were letting people know what an important position that was, that they were elders. I'm a deacon, I'm an elder at Church on the Way. <laughs> that would be me, an elder on church, at Church on the Way. And Jack, when he heard about this, Pastor Jack, when he heard about this, he called them all in and he said, you will no longer use the word, this is what I'm hearing, you will no longer use the word elder or deacon in describing yourself. You will tell people, if you want to tell them what you do and how important you are, you will tell them that you are a flunky at church on the way. Oh. <laughs> that describes your job. And he dealt with the issue of pride and arrogance and dealt with it in a way that he, those people knew that they were loved because they were not allowed to continue in the wrong direction. So that sometimes that has to happen. So I'm sending Timothy to you for all seek, uh, but you know his proven character. He's like-minded on the essentials. You know his proven character. You know what he's like. That as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. I'm going to be sending him as soon as I find out what's happening with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself also may come shortly. He, his heart's desire was to see them. His heart's desire was to be there with him. Timothy's life had shown his, uh, his love for the Lord, his humility. Timothy had the fruits of salvation. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. You sent him to me. You sent him, and you, you sent him with money. You sent him with encouragement. You sent him to serve alongside me. And while he's been here, he has gotten homesick. He is longing for you all. And he was distressed because you found out that he was sick. And yes, he was sick. Almost unto death, he was sick. And, but he didn't want you to know about it. He's sad that you know about it because he of his love for you. He doesn't want to discourage you in any way. I want you to notice that Epaphroditus was sick and was not healed. He was eventually healed. But it doesn't give indication that he was automatically healed, that he was miraculously healed. So when we ask God to heal he can do it. God can do it his way. Sometimes God does it miraculously and immediately. Sometimes he uses doctors. Sometimes he uses hospitals. Sometimes he uses different techniques. But it's his call. And I don't get to command him. So, And was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should be sad because you sent him to me, and now he's dead. You sent him to me, and he has died here. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem because of the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to, uh, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. I don't want you to look at Epaphroditus as someone who just couldn't make it here. I don't want you to look at him as somebody who just couldn't cut the mustard here. He just got so sad he had to leave. Just couldn't handle life in Rome. I want you to look at him, with, put him at high esteem. You need to know what an amazing man this man is who walks with such integrity and humility. I want you to make sure that you lift him up as he has lifted me up, as he has been concerned about your welfare. Always concerned about others and how others would be received. 
Epaphroditus, Timothy, Paul were all men from Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. That kind of living gives us joy that transcends our circumstances. So we count it all joy. Jesus, others, yourself, right? Now next time, when we get together next time, we're starting the study with the word finally. You love that? In chapter 3, it says finally. So that's the way the chapter starts. We'll see how long it takes to get there, okay, to the finally. Um, so, Lord, I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, God, that you, um, you are always faithful and that you give us all we need to accomplish whatever you have called us to do. Lord, you have done great and mighty things, and you will continue to do great and mighty things. And we are blessed to be in your presence. Lord, I pray for the small groups, that as they get together, Lord Jesus, that you will just bless their time together, that you would encourage them, strengthen them, and uh, draw them close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. for listening to this Heart to Heart Women's Bible Study recorded at Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach. We hope you've been encouraged by today's lesson and will join us again as we continue to study through the Word of God. For more information about the Heart to Heart Women's Ministry, please visit our website at www.refugefamily.com or call our office at 714-891-9495.